Hi everyone, I'm Tanya. Thank you so much for coming because there's a party out there with booze and instead you're in here with me and I appreciate you. <laughs> um, so this talk came about because, so I um, do all, so I have too many jobs because I just really like to work. And so one of my jobs is I do consulting one to two hours a week at this place called IANS Research. And so I've been doing that almost six years now. And so I meet with different AppSec teams and I've met with almost 400 AppSec teams and I help them with their programs. And so all of, so one day one of them was like, hey, instead of telling us what we should do for our DevSecOps program, could you make us a list of what not to do? And so I started doing it and I just went through all my notes from all my, and I was like, wow, I have a lot of stuff. And, and then I was like, well, maybe I'll write a talk. So all of these, I, I, there's one or two where they're just so absolutely terrible, only three or four companies did it and it made it, but most of them, 10 to 20 companies made this mistake. And so there's 15 things where I'm like, oh, please don't do that. And so that's what this talks about. Um, so we're gonna talk about DevSecOps. We're gonna talk about tried, tested, and super duper failed uh, things. Um, I also like walking around a lot. I, I don't know, I just do. So, um, oh yeah, I'm supposed to stay in these lines so that they can see me up there. Hi, okay, so we're also going to talk about how and why to not to do these things. So what could we do so these things don't happen to us and we have better experiences? Uh, so let's go. Um, so this is your nerd for this evening. I'm Tanya. I felt Sam did a better job of explaining what I do than me. So I'm just, if I brush my hair, I look pretty good. Um, so I call this resting AppSec face. Um, <laughs> this is when people have done things where I'm like, oh gosh, what have you done? So when things are not going my way, I make this face. You, you did what now? What have you done? Um, and um, so part of why I'm showing this is because my definition of DevSecOps doesn't match everyone else's definition. So you have to bear with me for, because it's my talk, so you get my definition. You don't have to agree with it, but just try not to boo. So an AppSec person who works with all the cool DevOps tools, who works in a DevOps shop, I think is doing DevSecOps. So we're doing the security part of the DevOps. We're trying to help all the awesome DevOps folks arrive at the finish line with a safe, reliable, secure product. That's what I like to think of. I get to automate stuff, hang out with cool dev people. I like it. But a more common definition that I see from all my clients is it's the AppSec person who owns the tools and they don't think they need to do any other AppSec. And um, we're gonna talk about that. And so now that, oh, there we go. So, um, so DevSecOps isn't, easy. I think it's really fun, but I don't think it's really easy. Sometimes it goes poorly. And a lot of us don't talk about why, because we're under NDA. I have signed, like I have this folder, I have like 50 NDAs. It's stupid. Um, because I've worked with so many companies and done so many things. And then we can't share data. But because there's so many companies, I was given permission to share. So I'm hoping me giving this talk will encourage some of you to share more lessons because I don't want us to all have to learn the hard way. So I'm hoping I can encourage you through a bit of self-deprecation and some slides. Okay, so number one, the boy who cried wolf. Oh wait, no, 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 back, 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 back. Okay, so this one is about um, breaking builds on false positives. So this is the one I see the most. So we have, let's say, an old static analysis tool and we just flip everything on. We don't tune it. We don't take time to make sure it works well. We just shove it into the CI CD and then it has all these false positives turning up and then it breaks the build and we're not letting the very nice DevOps folks get to prod. That's what all of us want. We wanna get to prod. <laughs> Who here has written code and wanted to go to prod very badly? Oh, not very many hands. Maybe this is why we don't have enough empathy. Um, so for the first 17 years of my career, I did software development, which means really wanting to be good enough to go to prod. And so if you stop me and then I find out it's not real, I'm not pleased. <laughs> like if I've messed something up and made a big problem, that's cool, but if it's false, it's like, Hmm, so how do we avoid this? There are a bunch of ways. 
Um, so I work at a vendor, so please take some of what I say with a grain of biased salt. So sometimes you have to take your tool and throw it in the garbage. If you are not getting the results you want, sometimes you need to go back to the drawing board. Sometimes I find uh, I, I have one tool that was expensive and it, it works well outside the pipeline, but maybe it's not the right one for inside the pipeline. So I'll get another one. Sometimes I get two and one of them tests some stuff and one of them tests other stuff. But the key here is that you need to make sure it's not spinning false positives. If you have a tool that spits lots of false positives, all is not lost but I don't think you should put it in your CI CD. So what you could do instead is you could run it every Sunday and then Monday you could come look at those results. You could um, only run a couple of the tests that it does so that those ones you know are good and you run those in the CI CD and the rest don't go. But every place I've worked where they have lots of false positives in the CI CD, when you're not looking, they turn it off. And that helps no one, including them. And so, um, so that is the first one. Okay, so the next one, untested tools. So software developers test and test and test and test. And they're so, we like to make sure everything is good, right? As security folks, we should test. We're testing for false positives. We're testing that it's actually looking at the right things that we need. We're testing um, that it's going fast enough. We're testing it doesn't crash. We're testing all sorts of things to make sure it goes well. I have seen many places where the security teams, like the vendor said it's awesome and it has no false positives, and we all know salespeople never exaggerate, ever, and they never lie. Um, and then they put it into the CI CD without any, they're just like there, and they just put it on blocking mode because they don't like having friends. And, and then it runs forever, or it crashes, or, or whatever the thing is that it does. And then you end up with breaking developer trust. And so this might sound odd to test a testing tool, and maybe that sounds a little meta, but I find first what it, so what I like to do, um, and maybe I am, I don't know, I like playing with things. So I'll take a cop, so first of all, I find a developer that likes me and tolerates me. Then I say, can I copy your CI CD? So I take a copy of their CI CD, and then I remove the parts where I release stuff so I'm not messing up their crap. And then, I copy my tool in and I run it and I, it's awful the first time usually. <laughs> it's like doing weird things, I'm not sure. And then I play with it and I tune it and I play with it until I'm like, okay, it's going pretty fast. I'm getting a result I think I like. Seems not bad. Then I show the dev, the tolerant dev, the one that likes me. And then if they think it's cool, then I'm like, can we maybe put it in production? Like so at, and by production for them. Right, so in their real live CD, CI CD that releases stuff to prod. And then if that's going well, then I'm like, can we show other devs that also are tolerant of me? And then once some of them have it, then it's like, okay, can we roll this out to everyone? And so I know that that takes more time, but you lose fewer friends. And when we break the trust with the software developers, we not only don't get invited to cool stuff like this, but you don't get invited to the threat model. You don't get invited to the kickoff meeting. You never saw that architecture design because they're avoiding you because you do untested tools. Okay, so next, artificial gates. Um, I wrote a blog post about this. So I remember talking to some people and they're like, we can't wait for the CI CD. And I was like, awesome, you love DevOps too? Because I'm a dev, so I think it's awesome. When I discovered DevOps, I'm like, this is the best. And they're like, yeah, because we're going to break all the builds. And I was like, oh, mm, tell me more. Um, and they're like, we're not allowed having gates anymore. So they make pretend gates. So they just always break it. So you have to come talk to them. And they kind of want the devs to grovel. Has anyone worked somewhere where you're a, de you're a dev and you're kind of expected to grovel to get to prod? Yeah, OK, so someone's honest. Oh, and it's like, here's like 37 hoops and we just enjoy watching you go through them. Most of them don't mean anything. Um, and so this artificial gate thing is where it's like, I've been told I'm not allowed gates, but they're going too fast for me. So I will slow them down and pretend it's the CI CD. I will pretend it is my testing tool. I will pretend all these things because I, I don't, 
I'm not able to go as fast as you, and I can't let you get your job done. Everyone's gonna come down to my speed. And this sucks. This leads to not awesome culture. This leads to a lot of resentment. And I didn't know what to call it other than an artificial gate, but where they're trying to reinforce the thing that they were told they're not allowed doing anymore. Has anyone seen this, the artificial gate, where they're told they're not allowed gating anymore, but they made all these breakpoints that aren't supposed to be there. So I'm the only person, maybe you're seeing it and you're not wrecking, you're not calling it that. Mm -hmm. Oh, not the DevOps person, the security person, yeah. So um, they put, um, a, like basically in the CICD, they add a thing where you have to come and talk to them. So it just gets to a certain point, it needs a manual approval. And it's like, there's not supposed to be manual approvals in this. And it's like, oh, well, you have to come talk to me. And you talk to them and it's like, okay, what? well, I want you to fill out this piece of paper. Why didn't you ask for the piece of paper earlier? Like, when did this piece of paper become part of the process? And there's just the things where they stop you along the way so that you can't get to prod as fast as you want to, but without a formalized process that's approved. So they're kind of making it up. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Oh, there we go. Instead of creating a policy to create a gating process, you abuse the CI CD to make your own gate. That would have been helpful. Um, okay, so missing test results. Um, so I was actually talking to some people earlier about this today. So there are certain types of tools. So there's tools that I like better where they can cut tickets directly into you know, um, your GitHub issues or a JIRA ticket or Bugzilla or whatever it is that you want to use to keep track of your bugs. I like that a lot. Some of them will send you an email with a PDF and I'm like, okay, I will take that. But then some of them are on a server somewhere and they're behind a firewall and you have to RDP into it. Then you need an account, then you need MFA, then your account expired. Um, and then finally you get in and then there's like everyone's test results and then you try to find yours. And then you find your apps and then you're like, which part was the part Tanya was talking about? This is what I mean when I say missing test results. Like when you run a CI CD, you just see your results in it. And so being able to just, so I, okay, so who here kicks off their CI CD and then sits there and watches it? <laughs> yeah, I like to sit there, I'm just like, all right. And then I can see the results, I can see what's happening. I'm like, oh, this failed, what have I done, right? Or, oh, this passed, I'm awesome. And I, I watch it go through and then I can see the results right there. But imagine it's like fail and you're like, okay, and it's like, I'm not gonna tell you what's happening. You have to jump through all these hoops and then you can see the results. Devs don't fix those bugs very often. They don't do all the extra steps. You will get better results. So to avoid this, make your tool show the results in the CI CD. If it can't show it there, have it send an email or go directly into your GitHub issues or wherever it is you track these things. Yeah, Jira, Bugzilla, all the things. But if they have to do something totally outside the way that they work, totally outside the tool set that they're used to using, a lot of them aren't gonna do it. They're just not gonna do it. And so I was talking earlier about this tool that we were paying $160,000 for per year, and then we looked and no one had logged in in six months. And that is why bugs were not getting fixed. And they're like, oh, it's really hard, blah, blah, blah. So this is a thing we can avoid by just making it visible to them as easily as possible. So runaway tests. So we talked about um, untested tools, but specifically this is about tests that run for frickin' ever. Um, if the CI CD takes eight minutes to run, and then I come along and I'm like, I bought a whatever, it usually ends in A-S-T, whatever it is that you bought, and then I put it in, and then it, it takes till tomorrow to run. <laughs> Uh, it always, like, it takes hours and hours and hours. That's not okay. And I've had a lot of security folks tell me, oh, well, that's how long security tools take. No, I don't care. Devs have things to do. They're not going to wait for you. And this is another time where they're just going to turn it off when you're not looking. I've seen it a lot of times where they turn it off. And so if you have a tool that runs really slow, 
you have choices. You can get a different tool that runs faster. You can run that tool overnight and then look at the results in the morning. You can have an asynchronous pipeline. So you have a release pipeline and you test all the things you think are important enough that you must know before a prod. But then you have the super slow test that runs 18 hours and it does not, no one's waiting on you, it, but it's automated to run and you see that report when it's done. Another thing you can do is you can take your tool, look through all the tests it runs and just uncheck, turn off all the tests that aren't truly important to you. Um, I had another thought of a thing you could do and I forget now. <laughs> so, but there's, oh, um, oh, I forget, that's okay. I have lots more to say. Um, oh yeah, and so another thing, oh yes, that's the thing. They use up resources. So while I'm running this really slow tool that goes on and on and on, no one else gets to run their tests. And like depending upon the way you're doing it, maybe you're monopolizing the dev server so no one else can do stuff there. Like if you can run those things after work, um, if you can run those things out of band, if you can try not to be annoying to everyone else on your team. So I'm saying this because I did it. I did most of these things. Um, and I definitely did this one. And uh, my open source project team for the DevSlop project with OWASP, they're very patient with me. But eventually they're like, Tanya, <laughs> why do you have to have so many tools and why do they run so slow? And so that's when I learned I had to go faster. Um, impossible service level agreements. So this is gonna sound super obvious when I explain it from my viewpoint, but I see it over and over again, so it's not actually obvious to everyone, and I think it's obvious because I want you to think what I think. Um, and so that is, so there are, uh, so the first time I buy a tool and I scan something, it's gonna have bugs, right? Like almost everywhere, there's gonna, it's gonna find something wrong. I like to call that the baseline or the legacy bugs, the bugs that were already there, pre-tool bugs. Then anything past then are new bugs. I like to have a service level agreement for both. So the old bugs, so let's say I'm scanning something. I scanned something once that was 38 years old and I, I was 39 at the time, so I had seniority, but it was a really old app, right? It had a lot of bugs. And I remember the guys like, oh, the other AppSec guy said, I'm not allowed pushing any new code till I've fixed every single high in the app. There are 308, I think, highs. And he's like, I've fixed 10, and he won't let me push them to prod because we don't push high things to prod. And so he wasn't allowed releasing his 10 fixes because they don't release highs to prod. And I'm like, yeah, but they're already in prod, dum-dum. Um, so to me, it felt obvious we're getting better, we're improving, right? So no, new, so my service level agreement deal that I did with them and that I like to do is for the old ones, you know, we're gonna try to chip away at whatever you're at. So maybe you're, you have tons of criticals, maybe you have highs, maybe you have mediums, whatever it is. So we're gonna try to chip away at those a little bit at a time, but for new ones, nothing above low unless we've decided to accept that risk, right? So either we've accepted the risk because we don't really feel it's a thing or the scanner says low. And then you have two service level agreements technically, right? But then you can fix old stuff. And this might sound silly to you that someone would stop you from putting lots of bugs in. Well, I have this friend and um, I was consulting at a place like just a couple hours a week for um, two years. And I left to do something else and she, I got her to replace me and she was doing full-time AppSec for a year. And she's like, Tanya, I just quit. I'm having some wine, you have to come over, I have to tell you something. And so she had been searching in GitHub and she saw all these issues. So she had fixed these bugs, these high and critical bugs. And she's like, I did a search on my name and there were over 100 and they hadn't been merged. And I asked the guy why, and he said, well, because there are still other highs in those apps, and until she had fixed 100% of the highs in those apps, she wasn't allowed releasing. She's like, so then I searched your name, and there were almost 100 from you. 
and that was like years earlier and he had been blocking all of the high fixes because i don't release high bugs and in, in in prod and i was like and so there are a lot of people that believe that they are fighting the good fight by blocking you. And so if you see this, please enlighten them as to how we're improving. We're still improving. We're not fixing. We're not creating a new bug in high. Does this seem obvious to everyone? Why don't you keep seeing it? <laughs> OK, next. Um, untrained staff. So this one's pretty obvious. Um, but it still happens where a company's like, we're going to do DevOps starting next week. No one gets training. <laughs> and and then guess what happens like mistakes right like mistakes where maybe the people in this room wouldn't make it because you're doing continuous learning if you showed up here you're here on your own time and learning is clearly important to you right but there's lots of us where you know we have little ones at home or we have a like a music career or we have like whatever else that we're doing with our time and we're not taking our personal time to continue to learn and we're not being supported at work to learn and then they get thrust into this new thing and they have no idea what to do and they're doing the best they can and so the fix for this is obvious train your staff if you're going to ask them to do something new you you train them and i don't mean you necessarily have to hire a consultant that comes in and trains or that you have to send them to XYZ school. It could be job shadowing. It could be having a consultant come in um, and like slowly mentoring them over time. There's lots of options, but you need to teach them the things you want them to do. And it, you're probably like, this is so obvious. I've seen it so many times. How, how could he put two extra zeros on the Kubernetes deployment that cost us $30,000? I'll tell you how you gave him zero training, shoved him in there, and then we're like, let's hope for the best, and the best did not happen. <laughs> yeah. I'm forgotten bugs. Don't worry, Tanya. It's in the backlog. That's why I'm worried. <laughs> um, so uh, I often will work places, and we will, like, they'll do a pen test or, or whatever they'll do, and they find a whole bunch of bugs. And they fix one or two at the beginning. And then they put the rest into JIRA or whatever the magical places where those things go. And then they're like, Whew, glad that's done. <laughs> and then they don't fix them. And so I, so the, like, and then they just stay there and they're still dangerous, right? Even if they're in JIRA, they're still dangerous. <laughs> um, and so um, what I like to do as an AppSec person is kind of just go and look. I like to look through the backlog, and it's like, oh, this has been here 365 days, and it's a high. Can we talk about this? When were you going to look at this? Because they're getting asked for new features and, and more high-priority bugs, like basically things customers noticed or things that made the app fall down or whatever, and they're not necessarily sitting there looking at the security bugs unless you ask them to or you nudge them to do so. And so if... If you could just search once a month for security bugs of a certain like level, like high or critical or whatever is your jam. And then the age. They're not like wine, they don't get better. And, and if you could do that and then just like nudge people, be like, hey, I saw this. Can we talk about this or could you fix it? And then I, we could not talk about this. Whatever you want. Um, but if you do that, you will see some movement on some things. And it, it's worth doing. Oh, and that's Dev and Sec, and they're high-fiving. Um, OK, so no positive reinforcement. Negative Nellies everywhere. Um, th this might sound weird, but the security team usually comes and gives bad news. Like, who here has had a visit from the security team where they come to tell you that you're awesome and you did something great? OK, more than zero hands. I'm pleased. Um, I feel. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> but like, what if when we looked, like, so let's say we're on number eight instead of number nine, and we're looking at the age of vulnerabilities. Instead, we also look at who fixed a whole bunch of bugs, and then we call them out for being amazing. What if we congratulated people? It's like, you know, you passed your pen test with flying colors. I'd like to take you for coffee. Um, what if we had like an all-star champion? I worked somewhere once and they had a consultant that was before me that was mean. And he had a, a, a wall of shame that was on the fridge in the, in the kitchen. And he would put a thing of like worst developers who made the most security bugs. And 
I went to go eat lunch and I noticed it and I also noticed no one was in there eating lunch and they're like, we feel too ashamed to go to the kitchen. And I was like, wow, this is going in the garbage. This has never happened. This is the worst idea I've literally ever heard of. And so I changed it to the awesome page, right? Like, and it, I didn't have 10, I couldn't come up with 10 <laughs> reasons that they were good, but at least I came up with two or three of like, this person fixed a bug in under a day. This person fixed five bugs this week. This person um, shared this lesson with this person, right? And I started having good things and positive shout outs instead, and they started using the kitchen again. And it seemed so obvious, right? But so if we could do any positive reinforcement, we will blow everyone's mind because generally security teams are mean and you will seem like the most forward facing security person ever. I'm not kidding. Okay. Number 10, only worrying about your part. I'm super guilty. I'm so guilty. Um, so sometimes security folks and DBAs and programmers and everyone, we just think about our part and a huge part of DevOps who, so who here has read the DevOps handbook? Okay, and who here has read the Phoenix Project? Okay, so the first way of DevOps, emphasizing the efficiency of the entire system and then secretly whispering in my ear, not just your part, Tanya. <laughs> um, when I was a dev, I'd be like, here's the code, tough luck with that, good job, ops, see you never. Um, instead, now DevOps, we work together, Dev and Ops and Sec, right? And so we have to think about how things affect them too. You should, like, I should not be handing a pen test to them, like the results Friday at 4 p.m. when they're supposed to be releasing Friday. It's like, here, Thursday, just work all night forever. And then you're totally going to not make your deadline Friday. Ha ha. Like, we need to think about them too and how our part affects their part. And so I'm gonna give you a brief example. Um, so I was working somewhere and I thought I was awesome. I always do at first. <laughs> and I rolled out this tool and they had, a, they had, had a, a static analysis tool that no one really liked very much. People weren't logging in, people weren't using it. So I had gotten some of the devs to help me pick a new one and it seemed pretty good and I'd rolled it out and I had this parental dashboard where I could see every project. It scanned everything once a week. When people checked code in, it scanned it. Um, I thought I was awesome. So people would check code in and then they'd get an email if they had made a new bug. If they didn't get a new bug, they'd still get an email. <laughs> um, and and I, I was just like, I'm awesome. And then I had a meeting or no, I got an email from a dev and they said, could you please stop humiliating me in front of the entire company? Oh no, what do you mean? And they're like, I checked in my code and I had made a bug and you emailed all 200 devs to tell them I made a bug and I wanna hide under my desk. And I did not realize I had set it up so that every single person in the company got an email every time someone made a mistake. And one, I was sending 200 emails a day. <laughs> Two, I was embarrassing a lot of people. And so I thought I was amazing. I had not been amazing. <laughs> and so I spent uh, like an afternoon yanking the whole thing out and then two or three days rolling it out again, which was almost a whole week, right? But then, I made it so each dev, only they got the email, no embarrassment. Um, everyone was not getting 100 piles of spam. You would only get an email if you had checked code in. Uh, and so like less spam, no embarrassment. People are getting notified in a timely manner. I was actually cool then. Um, and so I had to listen to them, but I had just worried about my part. I was like, this is great. And it was not great. And so sometimes we have to ask for feedback. Because I, I was like, what do you guys think? They're like, mm. And it took a brave dev to tell me this was not OK. And so sometimes we have to ask. So next, multiple bug trackers. I haven't seen this as many times. This was less times. But each time, it was terrible. This, so like you'll have some people tracking their issues uh, and maybe like GitHub issues. And then you'll have, like the company will tell you we use Jira and I'm like, awesome. And they're like, but also Bugzilla. And also like sometimes we put them in GitHub issues. And also we have like this Excel spreadsheet. 
Uh, but don't worry, there's only four copies and most of them are different. It's really hard to keep track of stuff if we have more than one bug tracker and obviously the answer is only use one bug tracker. <laughs> um, sometimes it's like, well, these teams use this one, this team uses that one, and those ones use that one. But it's really hard as a security person to keep track of this if there's lots and lots of different trackers. So if you have the power to influence, try to get them to use one so that you can see the same things they see and you can all see all the security problems. I don't know, I feel like this one's pretty simple compared to some of the other ones, which is why I put a big broken heart. <laughs> Next, number 12, an insecure system development life cycle. So this was the part I alluded to at the beginning. So, I, so my definition of DevSecOps is an AppSec person working in a DevOps environment and you get to play with lots of cool tools and do DevOpsy things. But some people, their definition is, I only do security in the CI CD. I don't give security requirements. I don't review architecture or design. I don't threat model. I don't arrange the pen test, that be your problem. I don't chase things to be mitigated. I don't give advice on new technology. And I don't like, and I'm not available because I'm busy being DevSecOps and that's the only thing I do. And I feel like we can't do good security if we're only little script kitties using automated tools and we're not talking to people and we're not helping them and we're not supporting them. I feel that every phase of the system development life cycle, whether you do DevOps, Agile, Waterfall, or whatever else you're doing, if you're wild and you're like, I'm gonna do rapid application development because I think it's the 80s, whatever you're doing, you need to have security in each part. Like we must have some requirements. Right? Like you're building an API, that's awesome. I would like you to use this API gateway or whatever your requirements are. And so I see this where they're like, oh, I'm the DevSecOps person. And uh, yeah, I don't have to do any of that pesky stuff. <laughs> I just play with automated tools. There's more to it than that. And this, has anyone run into this one? Yep, okay. Only Sam and I are only Sam. <laughs> Okay, so 13, overly permissive CI-CD. So again, I've seen this one less, but each time it was terrifying. I saw this talk at a Canadian conference called Sector, and um, this guy named Alex Dow, who's terrifying also, but he's a good guy, so it's not so bad. But his basically his pen testing team pen tested a Jenkins instance, and they exploited it 21 times, 21 different ways one Jenkins instance. He's like, oh, then we got in through this, then we got in through that, then we smashed it this way. And each time they had stolen all the code or got remote code execution, it was so bad. Um, and so it's really important that you protect part of your supply chain, which is your CI CD. This thing's so valuable, important. Ask solar winds, it can be used for evil, right? And so lock it down. Like some employees will disable tests in order to get to prod. Um, we wanna lock this down, not just so they don't disable tests, but for lots of reasons. Like, what if they change some configurations? What if they loosen, like, the reins a bit? Like, many, many reasons. You need to be very careful about who has permission. Um, one more, um, one of my colleagues hired a co-op student, and they were like, oh, I'm a, you know, like, I'm free flow in DevOps. Uh, everyone can do everything. Well, the co-op student put two, that's the Kubernetes story, the two extra zeros and the $30,000 cloud bill. It was that, it was that that wasn't locked down. Fun times. Okay, so next. So this is the last, or second last one. Only automating in the CI CD. So you can automate wherever you want to. You work in computer science. You are literally magic. You can do almost anything. Um, this is the type of, so we want to automate everything we can. We work in tech because we love automation because we don't want to do something twice. So like Disha said, if you do something three times, you should automate it. I would argue like on number two, I'm like, mm, I should probably automate this Ooh, twice. That's a lot. It's up to you if you want to get to number four. But basically we automate things because we want to avoid toil. We want to avoid errors. We want to avoid being bored at work. We want to show return on investment. Um, this thing tends to happen only 
when you have an AppSec person, I call them afraid of code, but where they've never written code before, they've never seen code before, they're not very comfortable with it. Their last job was QA, compliance, something completely outside of tech. They were late to a meeting one day, and you're in charge of AppSec now. And they're like, oh no, what have I done wrong? Uh, and they're in charge of the AppSec program, and they don't understand. You can automate whatever you want. Your DAST does not, well, I don't like to put DAST in CI CDs unless I'm feeling masochistic, but it doesn't need to go in a CI CD. You can automate it overnight, you can automate it monthly, you can do all sorts of things with it, um, but you, you don't have to automate only there. There's many, many, many different options, and so if you don't know how to automate things, that's okay, you work in a, company full of amazing software developers who love to automate things and they mostly would love to help you because that's some of the funnest part of our job. So if you're like, can I do this with it? Just ask one and ask them to help you and most of them will say yes. Okay, last one, hiding our mistakes and errors. So now I'm coming back to the beginning of the talk where I said I'd really like it if all of you would try to share lessons learned more often. We can't learn if none of us ever share with each other. If all of us are doing trial and error, this is a very expensive, long, slow way to learn, right? And I know, so who here is not under NDA? Oh my gosh, there's, there's two, there's two, three hands. I am impressed. More than zero, four. Okay, so you, you, you all are giving a talk next month, but besides that, <laughs> um, even when you're under NDA, there's still sometimes high-level things you can share, and I know we can't share everything. I know we don't always have permission. I'm not asking anyone to get into any trouble, but I wish we would share more learnings with each other because I had to stumble through a lot of these at first and see my clients get hurt at first and then they'd be like, oh, this happened, it was awful. I'm like, ooh, how can we fix that, right? So I'd like to ask all of you to try to teach someone something this month. Um, it can be a mentee, it can be a person you work with, it could be maybe your significant other explaining what a buffer overflow is over dinner. <laughs> if you're in my house, but um, try to teach someone something so that we have less mistakes because life will be way better if we share more as an industry. And with that, I have a conclusion and then I have some resources. So we learned some stuff. So some people learn best by what went wrong and understanding why it went wrong. So like just saying a whole bunch of best practices doesn't work for everyone. Um, it turns out that doesn't always work for me, it doesn't always work for everyone, so I thought I would kind of go the opposite way, like here's terrible stuff that happened, how can that not happen? Um, we talked about how to see DevSecOps kind of like from the other side, so that maybe we could do a little better sometimes. And we talked about several, basically most of these were strategies for rollout. Most of the DevSecOps problems are during rollout. Once you've rolled it out and you've ironed out the things, like things are pretty awesome usually. Um, and we wanna have the best rollouts we can. And now I have some resources for you. Um, so the first resource is, this is um, a link so that you can just go get the slides immediately. I do think, though, that it's actually all lowercase, and I might have fibbed there. So if you type it in like that, and it doesn't work, then it's all lowercase, um, because I think I thought I was fancy, but it turns out ConvertKit is case sensitive, so forgive me if it's actually all lowercase. Um, the next one is, is I have an online community that is free, and everything inside of it is free, all the events inside of it are free, all the courses. Um, and there's eight and a half thousand people in there now, and we like to hang out and do stuff together. And there's a bunch of courses on AppSec and secure coding, et cetera. Um, and this is eventually gonna become some grep community, so it's gonna move at some point, but it's here for like the foreseeable future. Um, I have a podcast, I or I did. It's kind of on pause forever at this point because <laughs> I have a new job and I'm having trouble doing all the things. But if you wanted to learn more about AppSec, we have 80 episodes about it. Um, and resources me. So I am a nerd that is on the internet. I blog, I video, I tweet. I just try to share as much as I can. 
and I love hearing from all of you. And so if you were like, this was not that bad, um, there's lots more if you want. If you're like, that was terrible, don't go there, you'll hate it. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Do we have time for one or two questions? Um, also, I have stickers, a lot of stickers over there, and you can have as many as you want. And if you take them, I we, don't have to do carry have them home table. across the ocean. Yes. So you should take them. And one very brave thing that Tanya does, she's also on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> I think she's probably the only AppSec person on TikTok. I'm the oldest and, person and, on all of and TikTok. And for those of you who did not attend, we did have a, an OWASP London event at TikTok in oh, yeah. November. And I thought, OK, we only have one TikTok person. Because I went to TikTok.com search for OWASP, and it was just you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, questions, question number one. Um, it's kind of a question or maybe just sharing basically uh, what I had an experience as you said you want to share so uh, as one of the worst practice like uh, not not involving the dev community uh, in the security tooling selection yes so much yes so he's saying a, a lessons learned not involving the dev team when you're picking tools total mistake I agree and sometimes they help me pick a way better tool I mean, it's my personal experience where uh, what, what we select a tool uh, without them involving, and we end up not they be, it been not been adopted. Yeah, they won't use it then. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Hundred percent. I agree completely. Sure. Thanks for the talk. So one thing you talked about was maybe moving long running or noisy tests out of the critical path of like the. CICD mm -hmm. and doing them maybe as an overnight or a weekly thing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions about how to make sure that those things actually have the proper attention paid to them if issues are found and that become just more uh, forgotten bugs or whatever the term is that you used? Like yes. if you find something that would have been a blocker, mm -hmm. a critical blocker, had it been on the regular path, what do you do on Monday? So a way that you could put it a bit in the critical path is, it's, so that's the thing that I forgot. So um, who here has heard of like ASOC or ASPM, so Application Security Orchestration or Coral I know you, you made one, I know you know. <laughs> or um, ASPM, so Application Security Posture Management. Basically, imagine the fanciest dashboard you've ever seen, and they suck up the results of various AppSec tools. So some of them, what you can do is you can add a policy to it of what is pass or fail. And so you can have it suck up. So I don't like putting dynamic scanners in my CI CD because they run forever and th there's a lot of reasons. Um, and so I usually do it like overnight or something. And I realize it's not up to the minute accurate at that point, right? But let's say I run it once every week. It's way more accurate than a lot of other people who are running it once a month, once a year or whatever, right? They're like, we're doing our annual pen test because we only care one day a year. Um, and so you can have that result be automatically sucked up into that. And then if you have a policy and it's like, oh, that's a, that's a high or that's a critical, so then it breaks it. So you can have your CI CD check that. So I know Defect Dojo does that. I, I think a lot of them do that. So you have it pull it, and then it checks all the ones that are out of bound. And then it tells pass or fail. And that takes the checks like 30 seconds. So it's very fast. Um, my friend was working at Nike and he took their 11 tools out of the CI CD, automated them all to run nightly, and then just had it pull that and he, their pipeline went from an hour and a half down to six minutes. And he was like, they basically put me on their shoulders and took me around and like, it was really good. And he's like, yes, theoretically, someone could have made a giant bug that morning and I might have missed it, that's possible. But people are doing crap all the time. And if the like people were flipping my tools off, people were skipping around, people right? So then people were being obedient because the check was 30 seconds. And so he got better results. Another way, so like let's say you have an asynchronous pipeline. So quite frankly, all of us have more work than we can do in a regular work week. And lots of us also have lives, loved ones, hobbies, things like that, sleep, things we want to do. Um, and so we can't do all the things. So um, I try to have it run and just send me an email. And then if I have time, I look at it. Because quite frankly, uh, if I give this thing full of false positives to a dev, they're going to resent me. And so it's like, I'll look through it, and I can do it faster. And I'm like, oh, these three interest me. 
let's validate, okay, so one's real and I'll go talk to them about it. Whereas a dev that could take them like two, three, four hours to do and maybe they're not sure and then what they decide is important versus what I think is important, I might not agree with them and I'm the security person for a reason. Um, and so then I'll try to have like a morning where I dig through the parts that are most important. So like that app's high priority, so I'm gonna look through that. That is not perfect, but sometimes I just have to compromise because um, so I told Samgrep I want us to make t-shirts that say, I am the AppSec team, because more often than not, I've been a team of one. Um, and like we just, there's too much to do. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. More questions? Yes, please. Do you want to say this? Yeah, no, no. Oh, okay. We're Thank making. you so much, Tanya, for giving us insights into the DevF processes. I would like to have a look now from the outside, mm -hmm. as you <laughs> asked me, asking for, uh, and especially on web apps. Mm -hmm. So during the web app, during the DevOps process, we test a lot. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of testing. Yeah. But why does nobody test what hits the browser? What, what do you mean? W3C validation. Well, the W3C validator is in two-sided sword. Either you see what problems need to be fixed with your errors and warnings, mm -hmm. or you use it to exploit it. Mm -hmm. But currently we see around probably 97% mm -hmm. of everything that hits the browser is failing. Oh. So how can that be? What is oh. going wrong within the DevOps process that nobody checks what hits the browser? Oh, that's weird. Um, I'm. I'm not sure I've seen that. You're walking over like you would like to answer, Sam. Did you want to add? I have seen it. And basically, yeah. go to any web page, right, any website, and then right click and choose inspect and open developer tools. And then look at the console. And even at the very famous dot coms, you see just a sea of red. It's like fail to load. This is a 404 here. Or there's a font which is missing. And mm -hmm. uh, how does it work? Right? So it looks like it's just <laughs> no, no, one, no, one, no one looks at that, that aspect. And, um, yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things that Michael looked at, this is another question, is because there are security bugs if your HTML is wrong, because you can get things it, like it mutation cross-site scripting if your HTML rendered on the page is incorrect. So, yeah, I, I don't, I think, that, well, I'm not sure if you've seen any tools, but apart from W3C validator, maybe you found something like it. No, I, I gave recently a talk on that, and what we currently see is a global inability to produce valid HTML, what is a fact. Um, so I can't solve that today, but I do, I, <laughs> but, but, but he's working on it. Um, but maybe, um, maybe this is something that would be covered by a pen test. So like if there's just errors and it's not security focused, it's hard for us security folks to kind of care. I don't mean to sound like callous or anything, but we have so much to do, right? So if it's like an error, but it's not going to cause a security issue, I'm like, eh, Maybe I'm fine with that. Like there, and with all of our tools picking up so many things as well. Like I want to focus on the things where I feel it causes business risk. I feel like it could hurt our customers or our citizens, or they're going to steal our money or whatever, right? And so people, so developers not fixing errors and warnings. I don't have the answer to that. Um, but if it causes actual business risk, ideally a pen test would pick that up. A lot of automated tools might miss it, though. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think I have an answer, though. Sorry. <laughs> but thank questions? you. That was great. Uh, I feel like we're just making him run back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> Exercise. Yeah, I was waiting for that. That's a lot of fun. We have a uh, throwable yeah, mic. Yeah, yeah. So this is a throwable mic. Oh my gosh, I've never heard of this before. Oh, it's one of my favorite things here. I'll switch it on, yeah. Uh, but you can no, no, I can, can you hear it? Uh, not yet, you have to switch it on. Well, you can ask a question. Now. Okay, actually it was more of a comment and question on the what was mentioned there, but with the WC3 validator, I can hear it working now. Um, it's what? Yeah. But I had a question with regards to that because... It's totally not awkward looking at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> it kind of... No, it stopped working, didn't it? Yeah. I think battery died. Uh, oh, yeah, that could be. 
Um, anywho, uh, Chrome can now run completely headless, like Phantom JS. So surely, like those errors, you can produce them with something like WebDriver, because developers are used to saying, okay, I need to automate, like somebody goes here, clicks on this, and it actually works or not. So you just automate sort of those web driver tests, but also include the output from the uh, inspector and like throws up errors where like shows the errors where it comes up for troubleshooting. But I don't know. No, that was great. I like it when my audience does the work for me and answers their own <laughs> questions. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi. Great Hi. talk, Talia. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned unrealistic SLAs, and I think that's a spot on, because if you put unrealistic ones, first of all, you shoot yourself in the foot. Um, developers will hate you. So I just want to understand from your experience, what was your thought process when you were determining the SLAs? What was your strategy? Okay, so each place is different. And so if the culture is we really care about security, you can you can set, first of all, you can set an SLA, period. I've worked at lots of places where we never have one. And I'm just like pleased if people will do anything for me. And I spend a lot of time persuading and quite frankly, like bribing people with pizza and other treats. I'm so not kidding. Um, and like just trying desperately to convince them. And so if you don't have like a good security culture, even just trying to set up an SLA and have anyone listen to you or take you seriously is really hard. And so then when I go to set up an SLA, I'm like, what are people doing now? Are they doing nothing? Right? And then I talk to the boss like, what type of security level do we want? And I often say, so are we looking for perfect security or just really good security or not pathetic security? And everyone's like, we want perfect. I'm like, you have 43,000 vulnerabilities in prod. You, that, like, that's a lie. Um, and so I'll talk about perfect security. So I've done counterterrorism, and um, I was the CISO for the election in Canada for 2015. And we spent like a million bucks securing one app because it was so important. We ran a full SAST uh, and had like a full, um, like we had a person come do a code review and run a SAST. We fixed everything. We had another person come with a different code review tool and did another pass. We had a pen tester come. We fixed all that. Then we built an entire returning office, held a pretend election, had another pen tester come, threw fake security incidents at it the whole time, did postmortem, fixed all that, then had the election. Plus, we did more stuff I'm not allowed telling you about. And we did that for one app because it needed to be perfect. I'm like, are you doing that? They're like, no. Um, and so then I'm like, okay, so let's talk about what you actually want and what you're really willing to do, and then you can talk about what an SLA might look like. And quite frankly, like if I see the OWASP top 10 in every single app, like we're aiming for not having the entire top 10 in every app, right? Or, or if like, let's say I find one or two instances of injection across the entire org, it's like, well, we're gonna just destroy injection over the next like three months, let's say, and we're gonna work on this and this. And then once it's like, okay, so I feel like I have a hold, people are listening, people are fixing some things, how fast were they fixing them? And then maybe I can set the SLA there. Because like you said, if you, so if you put an SLA where like, oh, uh, you know, criticals are fixed in one minute, <laughs> highs are fixed in two hours, whatever, ridiculous, not gonna happen process, right? Um, when you do that, you just discourage everyone and you set them up to fail. And then if they always fail, well, who cares how much we fail by? Right? Oh, we're late? Let's be really late. I'm going to build that new feature. That's way more fun anyway. Tanya just yells at me. Um, and so I think it's important to see how fast they're working and set it there at first and then try to mm, a bit more, a bit more, and try to make it a bit more strict over time. And I also like to target like specific vulnerabilities so that we feel like a success when we've destroyed the thing. So it's like we're trying to build, bring all of it up a bit, but also that that's really scary. And let's see if we can just knock that off the map. I hope that helped. But thank you. OK, so we are going to have a break. And then we have another speaker. Please don't leave. Yes. Thank you. Let's thank Tanya for an awesome talk.